What up, world? And welcome to another episode of Black Nerd Fridays. I'm your host, D. Neal, and I got the crew with me, Suds and Mr. Refiner here, and we got a special guest, all right? The creator himself, all right, of Crescent City Monsters. And when I say this thing is amazing, thank you, thank you. Hold on, wait, let me let me go to let me go to Mr. Oh, Refiner. Screen. Yeah, Mr. Okay. Refiner. Show, that, show that copy right there. That's the volume one right there. That's <laughs> that's issue one through four. Raise it up a little bit. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Back, back to the team. Back to how we were doing this thing. <laughs> This is, this is good times. Uh, we, we got Mr. Newton himself, man. How you feeling today, brother? We're feeling good, man. How's everyone doing? Oh man, we have we have good. a great time, man. Everybody's great good. Time. And we and we gotta let you know before we get started to the intro, man. I had I had so we had so much fun re- reading these first four issues, man. This thing kind of it just made me want more. Yes. yes. I don't know. I think she had fun reading it too. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, we we definitely had. Uh, I just had a great time. I read through them so fast. Um, I'll definitely get my hard copy when it comes in. But the digital copy uh, was still amazing, still beautiful. But I know when I hold it and start flipping those pages, I'm gonna feel like I'm being transferred into that world. Uh, but what we do here at Black Nerd Fridays is we always give every creator, especially Black creators, their flowers while they're in their grind mode, while they're not even known. Uh, while they're huge, it doesn't matter. We just want to show our love and support uh, to the creatives uh, because, again, this is what drives us in this anime, uh, comic book, sci-fi, movies, and more world. But one thing we do love here at Black Nerd Fridays is what? Craft beer. beer. So before we jump beer. in and talk to Mr. Newton about Crescent City Monsters, we definitely got to know what craft beer you drinking. And Suds, the camera is on you. I get to go first. Oh my goodness. So you know me. Every time I'm on here, I always go with themed beer. So first off, I wanted to do a little bit. And both of these beers are representing, let me just shout this out, Barrel and Flow Fest, where they did a bunch of collaborations with black owned breweries with well known bigger name breweries. Uh, and we can have here we have Caribbean Amphibian. Okay. Because again, we got a little bit of the Caribbean vibes going on. And this is a Caribbean double milk stout, which, I mean, you know me. I love my stouts. The beauty about this is that this is on the lower end. It's only 6%, which I'm like, okay, all right. You know, it's not too too bad of a heavy heavy hitter. But this is from Black Frog and East End. And this was brewed out in Pittsburgh. So got to give that a little bit of love there. But this one, I think it's more inspired by the artwork. And I think that this here is just absolutely gorgeous. Again, another barrel and flow. Uh, inspired uh, collaboration beer and this one here is the calm before the storm and this is a collaboration between Jay Wakefield uh, down in Miami and War Cloud Brewing okay so you know this is about to be fire but again this nice, here nice. it's a sour ale with vanilla peaches and coconut and this is a six and a half percent so I'm really excited wanted to draw on some of the inspiration for what we're talking about today but those are my two themed beers for today Definitely let a can art on the second one. It definitely right. just looks like it came straight out of Crescent City Monsters. Hint, hint right here. Shameless yeah. plug because we're talking about it. Come on. Always. Mr. Refine, what are you drinking, sir? Yeah, I'm doing it light today. I'm not, you know, fashion. Right uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm doing uh, Ice Zopful. It is a uh, original Forest Black Black Forest Martin. Um, coming from Germany, it's a 5.7% ABV. I love this joint. This has been my go-to lately. And I don't have any other special theme beers. I ain't keeping up with Suz this week, so she got me. <laughs> oh, what? Right, and, and before, so we, don't, so we don't keep Mr. Noon waiting too long. Of course, you know, man, shout out to Moms That Beer out here with this flying buffalo, screaming pumpkin stout. Uh, she tried to get me all these stouts during Halloween, but it's all good because you know what? I love that high ABV life. <laughs> I think this thing is about 12%, yeah, 12% right here for that one. Then we have this wonderful porter right here, definitely Halloween Ooh. theme. Come on, I'm gonna keep it inspired right here. Pumpkin s'more imperial porter at 11 percent ABV. Yeah. <laughs> and then last but not least, this I like this one right there, the imperial. Come on, a peanut butter cup imperial Ooh. milk stout. But look at the, look at how that thing is dripped. Oh, it's and dripping. Purple it's and gold. Dripped. Come on, man, that's a beautiful. Those are all royal colors right there. Okay, so shout out to them. Okay. Daddy's working. Daddy's working. I know, Daddy. Mama, I know. Later. All right. So let's get into let's get into the life. And excuse me, but Daddy duty is the way it goes. 
Uh, I'm going to start on Mr. Newton. I want to figure out uh, what inspired you to create Crescent City Monsters. And I'm going to throw the camera on you, but if you like the roundtable discussion, you just let me know and we'll get back to it. But we definitely want to know where this inspiration came from. Yeah, well, uh, first I'd like to thank you guys for having me here. Um, it's been a while since I did uh, an interview, so it's it's kind of fun to just be able to talk about my work and reach uh, across to your audience. Uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Um, yeah, and as far as uh, what inspired me to create Crescent City Monsters, well, um, so I started... Well, I decided to create comic books about four years ago, right? And um, usually as a creator, you have all these stories in your head, right? Like, which which stories are you going to go with? And um, I decided to go with Crescent City Monsters because at that time, uh, I was... Well, not at that time, but um, previously, uh, I was a big uh, Walking Dead fan, right? Of Robert Kirkman's Walking Dead comic book series. Um, this is even before the... The TV series came out. I was a, a big fan of the, the comic book series, and um, I had read about how Robert Kirkman he basically lied to his editor about what the comic book was about. <laughs> he he uh, originally um, he told them he wanted to do a zombie story, and the editor came back and said, "No, um, zombie stories do not sell it well in comic books." But then Kirk may lie and say, oh, oh, no, you know what? There are going to be aliens in the future, right? In the future, <laughs> future issues, right? So, they... so um, yeah. So, but by the time his editors realized that there weren't going to be any aliens, it was too late. The series had, was going on and it, it had become popular. So, I, you know, I thought that was kind of ballsy, right? <laughs> so I, was like, <laughs> I was like, you know what? I, I, I want to I wanna create a, a zombie story, you know, but mm. I wanted to create a, a zombie story based on what uh, uh, Haitian voodoo zombie is, right? Because in, in Haitian voodoo, somebody becomes a zombie, you, uh, you basically, uh, there's a, a they, they say there's this, um, uh, this chemical that you give them and, and it causes them to die and then you bury them. And then, um, then days later, you, you, um, you bring them back to life, right? And um, basically they're your, um, you know, your prisoners, right? They're forced to do whatever you, um, you tell them to do. So basically, I want to uh, revive zombies or, or reimagine zombies in, in that capacity. And I also wanted to create zombies that were on the same level as uh, what you would um, say vampires and werewolves are, right? Those are supernatural beings. And sometimes, you know, they'll they'll get their own storyline in essence because of what they are, whether they're a vampire or um, a werewolf. And I wanted to be able to put zombies on that same level, right? Because currently when you have a zombie, or most of the times, um, there are some few exceptions, when you have a zombie, they're not um, major uh, characters, right? They're, they're not on the same supernatural level as the uh, vampires are, or um, werewolves, but I wanted a story where we can... Um, uh, set them to that level. So that that's what inspired me to create Crescent City Monsters. And I also wanted to flip the narrative in terms of how um, Haitian voodoo lowers were perceived, right? Because in the media, um, you have uh, Haitian voodoo lowers like Baron Samdi or Papa Legba. They're either misrepresented or just casted as totally evil or if they're not evil, they're really stereotyped, right? They're two dimension there's no exactly um, full exactly. dimensions and they kind of just kind of brush on they brush a brush barely brush the surface in terms of exploring you know um just the culture of it you know um so i i wanted to be able to put that in the forefront so in crescent city monsters uh haitian voodoo lowers like baron samdi and papa legba mm -hmm. they're out to save the world <laughs> as opposed nice. to being the the bad guys um so um, that's that's another thing that kind of that kind of inspired me to want to create a story like Crescent City Monsters. Um, I'm all for really reinventing and helping uh, reshape the narrative that you see when it comes to black anything in black culture. Because mm. um, when you watch TV, right, um, what they do is uh, every other culture gets a chance to show the good side and the bad side, right? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. 
the different nuances, the scales of gray, right? Within um within their storylines, the multi dimension. But you don't really see that a lot with um when it comes to black culture, right? Um, mm. And I think a lot of it too, what happens too is um because a lot of what we're doing is westernized, right? Meaning that it's coming from the ancient civilization of the Greeks and the Romans. That's the narrative that we're looking out through when we when we um create stories and heroes. But I want to be able to look through the, the our, our ancient African narrative, you know, what it means to um actually have heroes and characters within within the scope of that. Mm. No, I, I think that's and I'll, you know, team, I mean, crew jump in at any point in time, but I definitely like with Baron, I, when I saw Baron's character, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's one of, that's one of my, one of my <laughs> favorites already off bat. Uh, what, and, and I just like the, because it's bigger, I think with Baron and Lobo, it, uh, just, it, it's bigger than just the day-to-day aspect of, of, of mortals or whoever. Um, it, it's, they're, they're controlling certain things for a reason. Uh, and as you read the story, you'll understand that. Uh, but a lot you did you did jump into it and I kind of I don't want to be repetitive with the questions because you did answer a lot of the questions but I'll still go to this one anyway uh, especially with the aspect of the stereotypes because like what what were you when you were showcasing uh, what what is called Creole magic in the in this in the series like what what stereotypes were you attempting to negate was it or was it more so as you mentioned just earlier about just saying hey there's every other culture you have your you have your demons and your deities and all these things of that nature, but they never are just like the demons are all bad or the deities are all good or vice versa. So I just wanted to know, was there an in particular stereotype or, or, or a, mis, mis, no, I mean, a, a misunderstanding of what voodooism is in this aspect of the series? Um, yeah. So like you mentioned, I did touch on it a little bit, but I can go into a little bit more, I guess, and give some examples. Um, so <clears throat> one of the, some of the uh, stereotypes and the misconceptions I wanted to kind of do away with, sometimes it had uh, to do with, with visually, right? Um, so like, for example, what's typical is uh, you would have, if somebody was doing voodoo or something, you'd have these strange fetishes, right? Around like little voodoo dolls, a skull somewhere, yep. some, yep. some some weird looking thing, right? Or some evil looking ominous kind of like magical fetish or supernatural ornament around. So for example, like you don't see that. You won't see me do that. Because mm. <laughs> it's it's like a, a um, you know, a subconscious thing, you know? Um, people are think people are expected to see that and those are like visual clues like oh something's bad right so um even even as even for myself you know the, it's not you know it's not just for people who are non-black but it's even black people too you you're conditioned right because you yes. watch all the tv they 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 give you all these visual clues like okay you know this is this is the bad thing right so you for years and years you're used to that so i try to do things that like on a subconscious level, um, counteracts things like that. So, like I said, you, you know, I avoid. You know, sometimes I, I might, I might have put one or two, have Gene pull one or two skulls in, in the scene. But for the most part, you won't see things like skulls and voodoo dolls, you know, hanging or some craziness like that. And, um, <laughs> Which I appreciate, by the way. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> you know, even though uh, Baron, the Baron, I was like, okay, Baron, I see it. And he's just, he was OG for me. I was just like typical. Um, not necessarily stereotypical, but just I like you. You were familiar with the Baron, like when you saw what he looked like, you were like, okay, that's what we associate westernized way. But but continue because I love how it even developed more. Yeah, and I like the way Gene did the Baron too because um, so the the skull like on his uh, face is is pretty much like standard, right? That's mm-hmm. how he looks. But like you won't you don't see anything like you won't see skulls. <laughs> <laughs> like right, uh, a chain of skulls yes. wrapped around. Oh my God! Yes. Or, or anything like that. So that's what that's that's one of the things that I was talking about. Um, when I'm saying visually, like, okay, these I'm gonna avoid these stereotypes that um people say. Um, and e- I even try to avoid certain words like black magic, right? <laughs> like, yes. You know, yeah. um, I'll I'll call it like I'll say like dark magic, um, because. 
a lot of that stuff, like I said, is, is really subconscious and it really influences in the way you, you perceive things. And so um, the other negative stereotype is um, things like, well, um, like I touched on, the voodoo low is right there, um, always well, most of the time seen as the bad guys, but here they're the good guys. And, I, you know, you ex I, I kind of extend them to to a point where like they're 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 recognized as the um for lack of a better word deities um which i mean in certain respects they are but technically they're not but so they they you see that they stand um alone in the in in the universe as as different beings right like so for example there's a a, a there's this is a little spoiler but there's a line in there where um <laughs> Uh, Papa Legba says, you know, he he normally he could uh, repair tears in the holes in the universe, right? Yep. So it, it's it's showing that you know he he's a lower and he 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 performs certain functions that are on um be beyond what humans are known to, but and he has um certain um jobs that he does in the universe that that are, are way beyond um human jobs, but he still belongs to the supernatural and he's some somebody good and. He has a purpose, you know, so little things like that that I do to kind of um, counteract what people normally would do with uh, voodoo lowers, um, if that makes any sense. And, you know, I hope it's something that people picked on because a lot of it is like really on the cerebral kind of yep. like low key. You know, I don't really point it out kind of thing, but I hope, you know, just the, the totality of just the little things that I do, I hope people can kind of see it and feel it. I, I, I respect I, it a lot, yeah. particularly because I um I have heritage in it when you when you reference in that and I know it takes place in New Orleans and that's um part of my one half of my heritage. So shout out to the lower ninth war, shout out to uh, my oh, grandma yeah. who is Creole. So mm -hmm. I understand some of the references in there and um I lived there for a while, so I get the the lore and everything that comes with it. So this book actually resonated with me specifically for that reason, because I understand the negativity that comes with it. But I looked past that and was able to see um, not necessarily the message, but what you were trying to get across, like enjoying the artwork as well as enjoying the storyline while tying in these things that are traditionally spiritual and mm -hmm. uh, native to us before we have what we call Christianity in our lives. So this is very dope. Mm. I like that. That's yeah, what I'm talking about, man. That's what I'm talking about. See, and we just getting started. We got so much time. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to jump around on some of these questions because, like I said, I don't want to be repetitive and you answered a lot of the questions. So let's talk yes. about this black and white aesthetic. And oh and, I, and, I wanna, um, and, this, and this is a double up probably to Seth's question. And Seth, I'll let you take it from here um, as far as the – did you get any influences from, um, from Alfred Hitchcock? Uh, and that the Twilight Zone, those type of things like that, because I think the black and white aesthetic is ama amazing for the time that is set. So Crescent City Monsters is set in the Jim Crow South, uh, Louisiana, I mean, New Orleans, to be, mm -hmm. uh, to be exact, in 1963 and the beginning of the setting. And I just think that that carrying that on to the black and white aspect all the way up into 2006, which, again, I'm not going to give away a lot of spoilers. But it definitely still ties, ties in to New Orleans. Um, where, where did that concept come from, or is that was that more so just something where you were like, "Yeah, I, I just like the way it looks." So it it really it was. <laughs> so um, I'm I'm trying to find the right words for this. So um, you just say, "I'm mean, yeah. right. yeah. You say, "No, there was no rhyme or reason. There was no rhyme or reason. It just worked out." No. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much the. Uh, well, See? so I can't even say there was no rhyme or reason. It just it's something that just um, happened organically, right? I like um, it. So first, let me answer the the one of the parts where it's referencing like Alfred Hitchcock's um, uh, movies and what was the other one? Twilight um, Zone. Twilight Zone. Yeah. Just did you get in? Did that black and white? Get so um, from that at all? So there was another so, no, reason I, for the Hitchcock reference as well, but I'll, I'll let him answer about the black and white first. I, oh okay so um yeah the black and white was so it was done on purpose right um but it didn't really come out the way i had envisioned it in fact it came out better than the way i had envisioned it right so um like i said i was a fan of the walking dead and the walking dead was in black and white um now it's in color they, they have the color version but um you know when it first came out it was in black and white 
But um, so I was like, okay, I'm, I want my book to be in black and white too. And um, I sent Gene a couple of pages, like sample pages of um, uh, uh, Walking Dead. And I said, hey, Gene, while I look for a, um, a colorist, can you, can you color, um, can you shade it in black and white the way they do it in, um, in uh, The Walking Dead? And he was like, yeah, sure. And then when he bought, uh, sent me back the first page, I was like, holy shit. I was like, this is better than, <laughs> I was like, this is better than what they had um, in, the, in The Walking Dead. I was like, yeah. this is bananas. I was like, the first page, uh, when he sent me that first page, yes. I knew, I was like, I was like, I was like, I know, I knew Gene was a really good artist, but this is like, Beyond Yo. anything I expected, I was Blue like, out mind, to me, man. "Shout out to yeah. James, real." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I am uh, looking at the, when I first like for me when I'm going through and picking any type of comic, graphic novel, I always look at the art first. I don't even mm. read what it's about. I always flip through the pages for me, right? So mm -hmm. seeing the, the images for this, I was just like, I love anything that really does these huge contrasts between colors. And this one here, were black and white. I think just does that visually. It really draws you in to pay more attention to the features of the face, to really pay attention to what's happening in the background because there's such a good contrast with the highlights and the, and the shadows. So, and you know, a lot of times we get so overwhelmed with all the colors that we see in comic books, but when you get something like this that's completely different, that's in black and white, which then also, you know, most people would think that it's a dated piece, which it kind of is. But I also think that it, it draws a little bit more of a serious tone to what the story is, because typically when you see anything in black and white, it makes you kind of think that it's going to have more of a serious storyline to it. And I think this really just adds to what you were talking about earlier with with what you're trying to really highlight this culture It's like, look, we need to really pay attention because there is a story here. It's not just your typical black people, you know, running amok. It's not going to be your typical stereotypical, you know, oh, look, he knows how to use black magic. And like you said, you're trying to step away from that and really highlight the beauty of the characters and of the culture. So to me, when I saw that, I just got really excited because I was just like, oh, it's so different. And it's so good <laughs> at the same time. Look, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful visually, I got to say. Well, um, right. hey, look, she just, she said everything. No. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Not, um, I'm, I'm not even going, not even going to even add any more to that. Again, I'm going to keep jumping around because I definitely want to get to these questions and just open up the conversation more. This one, I think, is one because the way that you introduce Jonas as the uh, main character, at least from when you start the book, I, I, I love the fact of how it was just, it seemed so quick to where there was something happening, something was going on. You, you give, yeah, you give that aspect with uh, Moonin, if I pronounced the crow's name correctly. Uh, yeah. Again, I, I, I didn't ask that question, but I'll get to that later, hopefully. But you know <laughs> what? To, um, tag, to, to tack on to what you're talking about with Jonas, that was where the Hitchcock, Hitchcock part came in for me, because in that first little part of the, of the story, you know, something happens to the main character. And Hitchcock, yeah. Hitchcock was known, notorious for always taking on a main character early on in the beginning. So I was just like, ooh, is this where we're going with this? Like, is this it for him? Like, and it really gets you in because you're thinking, dude, you know, already kicked it up to the with the cops saying, like, I'm not going to use magic, but I need to because you're getting in my way. And then they do this uh, amazing. Spo spoiler alert, says. So. No, just the cop, just the cop part. Like, he goes for the cop and then he goes and does this great performance. But, like, it was really cool to see something so pivotal happen to a character early on. So to me, I was like, did you draw any inspiration from Hitchcock with that? Or was it just kind of just like, again, just how the story kind of evolved with that? It, it's just how the story evolved. But, you know, um, going back and watching some Hitchcock movies might actually um, be beneficial. So I might I might just do that. <laughs> <for real. laughs> and I, this is what came in my mind without Hitchcock, but I'm going to go back and take a look at it. So, <laughs> and I, but I appreciate that. It says dropping that heat as always. So Sorry, what, what? I know. What, no, no, you're good because that ties into this question of what the relationship <laughs> was with the order and sorcerers like Jonas uh, prior to the encounter with Queenie. Uh, I, I, that to me, it was just something that it just rings in my mind because I, there's a lot of uh, shows that came out that deal, as you mentioned, like you got The Walking Dead. You have a Netflix um, uh, anime that we were watching uh, that was dealing more with the the the, uh, the Mexican culture when it comes to uh, someone who's a sorcerer or who deals with um, supernatural beings as well. 
And I just really, but their their relationship as a as a uh, covenant or uh, or a order is is they're all going to be different. So what was that relationship like, or is that something that you're going to hold off and kind of do flashbacks and things of that nature that we got to wait and see for the rest of the uh, the issues of, of this series? Yeah, um, yeah, I don't I don't mind talking about what their relationship was like. It, I you know, um, so when I write stuff, I try. There's certain things I'll spell out. But then there are certain things that I, I don't like to um, spell out. I like to just let the dialogue and the action kind of like um, help figure, help people figure out, oh, OK, this is what's going on. Um, and I, I don't know why, but I just like writing that way. <laughs> Sometimes I, I don't like, you know, spelling, certain, like just making it easy for the reader, like and spelling it out because um, it just seems like like it's too easy or that's like really um it's uninteresting well to me um to write a story like that you know so i, I try to let the um the readers figure certain things out so certain things i did kind of drop um like or hints that i kind of dropped in the um in the in the chapters that that show you that jonas and the and his family and the order they they jonas and the family has nothing to do with the order they don't want to do have anything to do with the order um the backstory of the order is like originally the order was set up to protect new orleans from um its uh other supernatural um organizations right um or beings and but it, it quickly became corrupt right so at one point you know jonas and the family was part of it but then they they left because they saw the order was just becoming evil right um so jonas and his family have like this unsaid rule like you leave us alone and we'll leave you alone kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, I like that. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that kind of thing. So, and there are other um, members of Jonas's family who, who, who practice um, uh, Creole magic too. So it's, it's Jonas and his extended family. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not super big, but it's relatively large family of people who practice uh, Creole magic. Right. Hmm. Um, so that's that's and so they have that kind of relationship now queenie and the um the grunge they're sort of like the, the outcast <laughs> yeah the, the grunge are like sort of like the outcast of the supernaturals right um they're more like that they're kind of they're symbolic for the the lower class of any um system Def where you have class definitely got right? that got that off yeah. the bat as soon yeah. as as soon as the first inter, 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 introduction exactly. to Queenie, I was like, "All right, no, oh, this yeah. is going. This is this. Is, <laughs> I feel for them already. The Grunches got, they got, they got, they got my, they pull on my heartstrings." Yeah, yeah. So the Grunch are like, they're, they're so. And the thing I do with the order too, I try to show like, okay, the order, they're, um, they're bad guys, right? But they still have their own things within their own organization and system and how they deal with things that, that even though they're they they consider themselves supernatural beings and above humans and you know humans are petty and we don't really involve ourselves in human matters they basically still act like humans <laughs> they're petty <laughs> and and whatnot no matter what they think of, of humans they pretty much still 100 you know, percent, man 100%. Yeah. arrogance the yeah they're arrogant people. you know they still have a hubris. lot of this yeah hubris they the same the same racist towards one another come on yeah racist towards <laughs> one another they, they still <laughs> have the same so like the grunts are like the lower class and it's queenie who kind of who brings them up right because um but the thing is like even though they've they've um they've made it um they've they've raised or elevated their status they're still looked upon because of their history, right? Um, the grunge, um, the grunge really, they, they're they what they call like bottom feeders. If, if you ever had a fish, they, they, they have fish called bottom feeders and yep. they they kind of like eat all the, the nasty stuff that like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. other fish make in the- That they, we're not so, supposed um, to eat? No, I got you, I got you. <laughs> yeah, so the grunts are considered like that. They're bottom feeders. Like um, there's, I, I developed a concept where if, in New Orleans, um, in, in particular, like areas like New Orleans, when you have so much magic, there's this like a waste, right? Like the magic, every time you use the magic, there's like a, a magic waste or you can mm. call it magic pool, right? Mm. <laughs> and um, it, 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 um, 
it uh dirties their their magic their the ability oh, interferes yeah. with the ability to create ma more magic or do more magic so but the grunts have this one purpose they they consume this these things um they, they, and they they look like you know glowing worms and they yeah. um, we saw it yeah. Cronites, yeah. I believe. yeah cronites and they that's what um the the grunts eat right that's what they consume to survive anyway and that they have that symbiotic relationship with the supernaturals and the grunts where the grunts needs to eat these things to survive and um they need the grunts to actually be around so they can um do their magic and have this interference so th that's the symbiotic relationship but you know like i said they look down on you know they don't really have any other use you know they think like you know these guys are just eating now uh, they're just bottom feeders right <laughs> so yeah, that's how they treat it even though they're um, one of the most important characters since they keep yeah, yeah. Magic yeah. Going yes. to basket yeah. orders. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. If you think about it without <laughs> the crunch, the um the order would be just collapse, right? Hmm. Um and so I wanted to kind of make a social commentary on that. Like, you know, he, he, there are always classes in every every group, right? And hmm. There's always a reason why you're you're always looking down on someone, or you know, people are getting oppressed or whatever. And the reason I like Queenie is because she she's a character who says, you know what? Even though you know they they disrespect us and whatnot, I'm gonna make sure that we have the power that no matter what they think about us, that um we're not gonna be oppressed or you know um we, we don't have any to fuck with. That's what Queenie was saying. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you can say so it, she, man. Come on, we unfiltered yeah. out here like rolling money. <laughs> exactly. So she 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 she's like you know she's like that that one person who who elevated them right. Not necessarily in how they're viewed, but in in the power relationship, right? Power mm -hmm. dynamic. You, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always difficult, even if you. If you transcend, um, if if you if you climb up the ladder of power, yeah. um, you're still viewed as a certain way until you get to that point where you know you could manipulate the, how you're viewed. But until then, you're you're always gonna still carry that that old yeah. um, a woman, narrative. A, a female mm. character help elevate them. Oh, I love. Yeah, I just to yeah. highlight yeah. that. Here we go. So drop that fire on them. You get what I'm saying? Just, just <laughs> bring it in. A female character did that. Just, you know, I just had to drop that. Real I'm, quick. I'm surprised she ain't going into the time where, you know, in the continent known as Africa, when women was queens and and running kingdoms. <laughs> we don't even listen. We know that and already. All of, you sudden, get what all of a sudden, men took over and we start going to listen. Hell in the handbasket. But anyway, I don't listen. Want to <laughs> listen, we could talk all day uh, about shout that. Shout out to Jonas and his little brother Jojo eating oh. boudin at the beginning. Come on. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna say that's you know there were there were certain elements throughout that I really liked how the characters interacted with each other. I think that full family dynamic is something that I think is missing a lot in the media yes. when you think about yes. black people. Um, when you show an actual family dynamic where you know there is some some love, there's empathy, there's warmth. There it isn't where there's you know a, a lack of parent or a lack of love in the house. And I really like that you had that dynamic between the two brothers, regardless of their age difference. He was still there. He was still thinking of him. He still wanted to do things he wanted to do. And I think that that in itself, just the mother being a mother, right? And actually being there and being worried about him and saying, like, I know what you're going to do and I know what you, you know, you're what you're about, but be careful. I need you to come back. And I think that mm. to me, I really love that aspect of it. And just the fact of how the men that were in that group that Jonas was a part of the, the, the music group, how they really were speaking to the crowd and the crowd was really excited about certain some of the music that they had. So to me, I really just love the characters that were in it. I'm excited to continue reading it. But that to me. It always warms my heart when we are being portrayed in a way that is not associated with drugs. It's not associated mm. with pain. Like yeah. you can still get a, a story of him being, you know, a character being hurt or being chased, right? And and you know, doing things that may not be considered to be good, but in a way where you're still elevating them, that you're still empowering them. And I think that what your comic does, it does it in such a beautiful way. So. I just had to oh, add thank that. Thank you. I, I got a good listening to that. See, see, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and the self control to add the subject before we move on to the next question the self control that was taught because yes. what Jonas did for the scene that says, spoiler alert, <laughs> ruined. No, I'm just joking. I didn't ruin I was, it. Like, for that scene, to me, it was like, I could, I really could have took it to the level where you didn't return, but I hey. just gave you a warning. Because no matter because no matter what you do to us, and I know this is like this whole 
stereotypical Malcolm versus uh, Martin type of Martin Luther King. thing aspect, but reality was was just that scene alone for being a being a black male and, yes. and just black people in general, but especially black men and that authority of aggression versus versus my humanity, which they don't see me as human. Just that one very two page scene. I was like, damn, that self control was. That self control was just bar was bar none top level because if it was me, it'd have been a wrap. I would say he should, you know, just eliminate him from all existence. Like he didn't even exist. Like if I know that type of magic, you oh you gone. Your whole fam won't even remember. And and, (laughs) and that actually segues into this question where, (laughs) with Mister and I don't know if I pronounced his name correctly, so please correct me. uh, Corporon, Mister Corporon, I got the damn alligator with the chain. Shout out to him, man. Looking like <laughs> looking like he like Jake the Snake Part Five out here, okay? Oh. <laughs> and leather face. But anyway, what um, what um, I really wanted to ask this question: Like, did most of the supernatural uh, beings, whether vampire, grunches, were were they human first? And and to the point that you mm-hmm. mentioned in the story, spoiler alert, where you talked about using using your power, using this Creole magic, or just using magic in general. And and this this um, this chase for money or this chase for uh, uh, for some status and how it actually manipulates your body to something grotesque, what we call monsters. Like, did any of the other beings start at that level, or were they just they they were born as vampires or are born as grunches? I was really curious about that and wanted to know if you're going to be talking about that further on in your uh, in the story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was cool that you you brought that up because um, <clears throat> yeah, it's something that. Uh, so like when 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 I was thinking of this world of magic, right? It's always the idea that you you can't just do magic and um, that's it, right? You, you find out how to do magic and you do all these magical, great magical things, and there's no no price to pay, right? <laughs> but um, I decided, you know, and most most uh, stories that involve magic, they they do the same thing, right? There's a price to pay for this magic, right? Usually, you have to um, maybe there's a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice someone. You spill some blood or um, mm-hmm. give something in return, right? So um, that that was the basis of where I was going with that, right? So if you're practicing some kind of magic in this world. You, you have to give something up, right? Mm. Um, there's there's something that you have to, um, yeah, there's something you have to give up, right? Something you have to sacrifice in order to be able to practice that magic. And the things that you sacrifice and how you sacrifice is influences, yeah, the way you end up using that magic ultimately. And it, it does change you physically, right? So like um, usually, and this only usually refers to the sorcerers and the witches and the magicians and the shamans or whatnot, people who practice the magic, like uh, supernatural beings like vampires or the grunts or werewolves, they, they are what they are already. But if you're, if you're using magic in terms of like um, on the level of uh, like a sorcerer, um, which then, you know, that would take you know, that would require some kind of sacrifice and depending on what you use that magic for is when that that changes who you are so yeah the more you you use magic for i guess you know what some people would label as evil stuff um uh like let's say you wanted um to use your magic to get more money or more power or fame then mm-hmm. yeah your things that are, are considered sinful you know um you would you would definitely start to physically change and, and look like a monster and, and that's that's what they were referencing. Mm. Equivalent exchange, that's what it sounds like to me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, what you put in, what you want, you've got to you get out something. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. Boy. I'm glad I'm glad you did that too, because I was definitely as I was reading, I was like, man, this magic needs to be used all over the place, but you just continually um, not even hinted. You just continually, blatantly said it through multiple characters. It, there is a consequence to using it. You just can't use it freely, willy nilly, um, because on, you will man. turn. Not only will you turn into this, but you could. It, it corrupts you in a way because you're. How are you using it? What is the purpose? How disciplined are you? And again, back to that thing about self control and discipline. Being mm-hmm. disciplined that Jonah showed with the interaction uh, with the police officer. To me, I was like, dang, like that is. 
it's not even necessarily about what you can do to others, but what you can do to yourself. So yeah, you know what? relationship with the uh, Roboto siblings where they had to consider that when they was doing the things they did. Same oh. exchange. Exact yeah. same wow. thing. Yeah. Wow. But you, you know even got the, the last names down. <laughs> it's like <laughs> look at that. Uh, he said nine more, nine more. No. But you know what gets me though about the whole, you know, giving up a part of yourself. It's like you know, you think about just in general in our in our own, in the real world, but also in like any type of escapism type of media, right? You know, you always have these great examples of showing people who really have gone off the deep end. And you're like, but they're not, nothing's happening to them. Like what was happening, right? And you see this, you see this with greed in the world that we have today. So I can understand why a character might be like, you know what? They got away with it. I'm going to keep pushing because what their original intent might, you know, might have been rooted in good, but over time, because you see it's just not working, you got to start using more dramatic, uh, uh, you know, type of avenues to go down. I feel like, you know, I, I get it if a character just starts to like lose sight of that because they're like, we're constantly getting bombarded with the fact that you can always, you know, do bad and it doesn't seem to be a problem for you, right? Because in the end, you know, if we all believe in a, in a higher in a higher being. That, you know, as long as you said that you're sorry, you know, you could make it through and be all right on the other side of it. So, you know, I was I always like to see characters that push that boundary just a bit. That's just me. But, you know, that's just I like that. Aspect. I like that. So, says, says is rapid fire out here more than me. <laughs> uh, but that also ties in again. This is why I like having conversations awesome. with the whole crew, because it just keep going back and forth over and over just into the next question. So Kingsley, I got to talk about Kingsley, you know, and, <laughs> and they know, they know why I want to talk about Kingsley, Kingsley because- Why Kingsley, is that, D? He's a kid yeah. for me that he holds, he, he, he has his, he has his, uh, what he wants. And, and what I want to ask on this question is, do you want the reader to view Kingsley as a grandmaster that has a means to an end where getting power and making the order, the order in, in Louisiana, or excuse me, in New Orleans, making that order uh, top notch and one to be respected, or is it, or, or is it a, just a traumatized Grinch uh, who wants power by any means? And I'll let you respond to that. Um, so, the way I want people to uh, view Kingsley is um, is it's almost it's it's not it's not exactly like it, but you know it's almost like that you know Charles Xavier Magneto or that um, mm. Malcolm X and Martin talk about Luther. it, talk about but, it. It's not exactly like it. it's more it's more on a on a realistic level, right? So it's like, let's say you know um, you you're uh, as a group of uh, like black people, right? Um, we we there's a leader amongst us, and they bring us to the next level, and they're like, okay, we're we're pretty much equal with everybody. We'll we'll just leave at that, right? But then somebody within that group says, what are you talking about? Look. These people that you you're, tr you're trying to put us on equal levels with, they, do you, don't you realize the history we have with these people? This is what they did to us, and you don't think it's going to happen again? Give them the chance, you know. And then somebody um, and says, you know, I want to make sure that never happens again. I want to put us in a position where they will never be able to do that to us again, right? So um, that's what Kingsley is like. He's taking whatever. Um, uh, Queenie did to the next level. Yes, he's, he's not happy with where King, uh, Queensley stop. Um, Queenie stops, right? He's saying no. He's like, he's like, no, you can't. We can't stop here. We can't trust these people because <laughs> mm. um, they still don't respect us. And at the same time, um, and we need to make sure that um, whatever happened to us in the past um, never happened happen again. again. That's yeah. what. I'm, so I'm right. talking so, about. Don't yes. repeat, get to <laughs> it. Get to don't it. Repeat. <laughs> So that that would be like the next level of um, um I, I could picture like where where black people um kind of go to right like let's say you reach yes, a point in this country where um things um really uh, let's say really have gotten um a lot better right and you might have a, still a few incidents because nothing will ever be the same but you still have that underlying history right of how black people were treated right and there's still that stigma you know still lying underneath everything right um because <clears throat> you can never really truly erase your past or it takes centuries to really um erase the, the sentiments and the mindset of of uh, your past in particular it, it, it takes more than like two generations right definitely um a lifetime for yeah 
Yep. So, um, so it's basically that, right? It's two, two, two trains of thoughts, right? One's like, okay, this is this is this is where, we, as far as we should take it, um, and we don't need to take it anymore because we, you know, if we if we do, then what we become are people who we may not really want to become. Mm-hmm. But Kingsley's like, no, fuck that. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, I'm talking. like you know, exactly. I don't know what you're talking about, but I we need to protect our people yes. from um anything happening by like any that, means you know? necessary. Yeah, exactly. That's a fact. Um, so one, she, you know, Kingsley's more of a preemptive kind of guy. He's like, nah, you know, <laughs> no, no ahead. reaction. We got to be preemptive, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So, so that's his viewpoint, and that's. That's where he stands with that's that's the biggest difference with um with Queenie. But Queenie's more of a like a cerebral person. She's more like, hey, you know, how far are we if we do that, how far do we take it? You know, he's like um, all the way. <laughs> if we you know, it's possible that if you take it all the way, you end up becoming the people who you truly despise. Exactly. You know? so, but but that's so, what I oh go ahead, sorry. <clears throat> no, go ahead. No, but that's why I like Kingsley's character so much, and Same. that's he's my favorite Extremist. character right now Extremist. because it's like, <laughs> uh, uh, huh? Did I get it wrong? Ex- no, I'm saying you're an extremist. That's what I'm oh, talking. Yeah. About. No, it's you not like- an extremist. I just like that to which to what you were talking about, Newton. Just the the with Queenie and Kingsley, they both came from the trauma of like starvation and the mm-hmm. order, just seeing them as nothing but the bottom feeders. Even though, to your point, like you said. Without them, the ex- the excess, the waste of magic would have built up so much that those bugs, what are they called, uh, Mr. Refinement? The Cronites. The Cronites. The Cronites could have just blanketed all of uh, New Orleans. The Cronites could have got so large and with all their wasted magic and just distorted it uh, and just made everything crazy. But what I do like about Kingsley is he's like, no, this is, they only respect power. And I think, and again, I'll stop talking about it after this, but me personally, from the experience, from the experiences that I've been watching, not only the TV through document documentaries, through talking to people who are from different parts of the world, at the end of the day, and I'm just gonna say because this is me personally, like colonization, whiteness, this whole thing of of white supremacy has taken over us to a point where it's like we we're like Queenie is like you get free to a point to where you're not equal standing, but you have this power that gets your people to live. And the question is, like you said. Is it that we live and we continue just to do us and we we work with them or negotiate with them when we need to? Because you're no matter what, unless you're going to do a full uh, um, uh, unless you're going to do a genocide and take them all out, you're not going to get rid of them. So what are you trying to do? And, and Kingsley's point from my perspective is like to control them with fear. But that only goes so far because you don't necessarily even understand what it is that you're trying to get power wise that can control them when you don't even know what it is if you can control it yourself. So I just love that character because it's depth. And I hope that uh, Queenie and Kingsley have continuous conversations because those conversations are, when I say top notch, man, they're top notch because this is things that I think people, black people in particular have those conversations as you mentioned, man. So thank you very much for creating that character and really not just making him this, I'm going to be the, the most powerful uh, <laughs> uh, supernatural there is, you know, like not like a damn. But that's not our perspective. Yeah, that's, yeah, he's, exactly. he's giving it through our point of view, our lens. That's not yes. our perspective as a people. That's why he didn't make Kingsley that person. We right. have a dialogue. We have a conversation with each other like the way we have conversation with each other. We're not trying to say, oh, I want to rule the world. Hmm. That's not in us. That's it's not in us. Yeah, we were conquerors and we did different things, but that's not in us. That's hmm. in them. That's, that's the nice. difference. I see, Mr. Refine, drop the <laughs> so, That's not in us. That's in them. <laughs> so I'm gonna get into, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip my question that I want to go to. I'm gonna go to one that um because really you answered a lot of questions Mr. Refine asked. And Mr. Refine, if you if you wanted me to go back to those, man, make make sure I don't. No, I think he's kind of good. Um, he yeah. I I I get uh some some Haitian uh ethnicity there if I'm correct, especially since he said he's he's in the Bronx. So. I understand that, but I wanted to know if you had any um, heritage specifically in New Orleans. Like I said, I, my people's all from there, so I already know what it is. I understand what it comes from, but I wanted to know if you had that in your lineage. No, not not from New Orleans. I mean, okay. Not that I know of. <laughs> but right. um, I, I was I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So okay, um, Port-au-Prince. Um, yeah. So um, so yeah, and Haiti and New Orleans share. 
a historical and you know cultural connection um facts uh, yeah we so, do facts. so like uh, like for example um when the haitian revolution happened a lot of the um uh, there were there were a lot of transport um plants from what they call santo 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 domingo at that time and to uh, New Orleans because they they were afraid of what was going on and the, um, the revolution was just starting, and so hundreds and thousands of um, of French and and slaves actually uh, uh, went to New Orleans at that time. There were there was there were um, there were already black people there, um, but there were there were a ton of other um, slaves um, from Haiti. Um, historically, it's it's weird when I talk about it because. Um, this there's this concept right the historians have right um mm -hmm. so before haiti there was the island of um saint dominique right and mm -hmm. um technically if you if you anything that happens before the formation of haiti which was january 1st 1804 if you reference that historically you're just to be historically correct you, you you could never say haiti because haiti wasn't formed then you would have to refer to that the island of saint Dominique or Domingo, and mm -hmm. um, it's weird because I always want to say Haiti, even though it was before Haiti, it was officially yeah. a thing. But I'm I'm gonna say Haiti anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, screw the academics, but yeah. So um, yeah, there were a lot, there were a lot of Haitians who 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 moved over to um to uh, to uh, what do you call it um New, New Orleans, Orleans. Yeah. yeah, and a lot Should of. You know? So a lot of that that um their culture and and whatnot spread. But with that said, it's still um there was influences, but it, um like for example, Haitian voodoo and New Orleans voodoo are two totally different things. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. As, as I was well made aware of. Yes. <laughs> yes. First Don't this. get it not the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, um, we, yeah what the things y'all do is completely different. I know a little bit of stuff based upon some things my grandmother kind of told me. Um and I know some brothers I went to college with that were um, Haitian. They're from from New York, but they're, you know, they're they're practicing or the, the knowledge they have is like you said, completely different. Definitely different. But, you know, but there is a common I mean? ground between both the similarities. But yeah. you know, the thing that really bothers me the most about Haiti, how it's being portrayed in the media, in in modern times. You know, there's a lot of history that I think gets erased on what Haiti's influence has been. And the fact that it was one of the richest colonies within the French, you know, empire for quite some time. I mean, and, and it's yeah. it's 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 sad to see, you know, how Haiti is being reduced in the current media as it is. And we we know recently how the Haitians, uh, Haitian refugees were coming over here and how they were shunned. And mm -hmm. the fact mm -hmm. that it was kind of swept under the rug a little bit, you know, I mean, and 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 it's sad to see a country that has so much history that has contributed so much to to not get the type of respect and help that they should and the fact that they haven't been able to stand on their own two feet because outward forces have been kind of stripping them of their of their abilities to do that so i always want to at least highlight the the fact that there's a lot of history that's there and that we should not be reducing haitians to what we see in the media or to just voodoo there's more to them than just that but i just had to say my two cents on that <laughs> yeah, I had to. Bad because I, had to. I, I know definitely you were referencing i believe what was it the serpent in the rainbow movie that i remember seeing mm -hmm. you referencing that that dust that you put on somebody and you go to sleep and you uh bury them and all that that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the movie I remember watching, The Serpent and the Rainbow, and it talks about a lot of that. But that's the 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 point of view and reference that we have when we think of Haiti, specifically Americans. That's their only mm -hmm. concept, mm -hmm. especially yeah. talking about white-owned media. That's yeah, that's what's gonna be a fact. Show. And without and without Haiti, there would be no uh, free uh, black people in the United States from enslavement. So shout out to Dr. Greg Carr and Carl. Yes, he uh, talked about Saturday, that. He every talked Saturday, about Saturday, that. nine a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. I don't know what other time it starts on the East Coast. But we should try and get him on here. <laughs> Man, I would love to. You know, the brother loves comic books and he's very intelligent. Um, but no, this this yeah, is definitely. You, um, yeah, I want to add if if you oh, yeah. if you study a lot of times, um, you know, uh, being Haitian American, the you know, I'm unfortunately, you know, you you get a lot of those stereotypes um, when you talk to people. Um, but if you really study the the history of Haiti and you really want, because some some people, you know, they'll 
ask you, oh, um, how, um, how come Haiti has it so rough? Why, why is all these bad things happening to Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> to be honest, 90% of the times when people are um, asking me that, they don't really want to no. know the answer. They already exactly. have formulated an answer in their head. Yep. And mm -hmm. they're like, why don't you um, black people asking, get yours act together? That's exactly what they're yeah, saying. They, even black people. Yep, tell they, they're not asking. They're not asking, even black people, even, um, unfortunately, even other black people like that. Um, and unfortunately, like I, I was raised in um, in Brooklyn, New York, right? A lot of Caribbeans. Um, and, I, you know, I got a lot of, when I was growing up, I got a lot of um, backlash from other Caribbeans, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, um, whatnot, who who had um, negative stereotypes of, of um, Haitians. And, and that's crazy, you know, because you're, you're, you're amongst your own people, black people. Mm. And you would think like, hey, you know, everything's all good. Nah. <laughs> you no. Know? You got being Haitian. And cultures and, tri and tribes yeah. and religion, all that stuff, man. I don't mean to interject, so being, but I'm, I'm about to head out because I got to go to another podcast. Brother New. He's leaving. He's he's leaving. leaving. He's he's I know. <laughs> yeah. You're doing a D. You're doing a D. I'm, I'm pulling a D and I'm pulling one of your moves because... uh. Yeah, we. I just there. miss. I just but, miss every but, once in a while. Yeah, you did. You did. You did. You missed you you miss some of your own. But I did want to give some dialogue and you give him, uh, give him his flowers right here and let him know that this drink was excellent. Hold on, it man. Hold on. Let me zoom in on you, brother. It, it, Hold on. It, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Let me zoom yeah, in. Yeah, give him the spotlight. You gotta go get that, man. You gotta go get that. I go copy. DreamFuryComics.com. If I didn't get it, if I got it right. But you know, mm -mm. make it happen. <laughs> make it happen. He's <laughs> make sure y'all go cop that. And I gotta give him his flowers while he's here because this was an excellent comic. Like I said, it resonated a lot with me based upon my experiences and in my culture, some of the things that I understand about this. So shout out to him, man. I appreciate the artwork. I appreciate the storyline. I appreciate the expression of black people in a positive light, even though you had mm. some subtle things in there. I love it all, man. And I can't wait to wait to read the rest of the series for sure. So I'll uh right, man. I'll talk to y'all later Peace on. Man. Yep. Peace, man. All right, y'all. Oh. Hey, hold we, on, you muted. Audio. I was saying you muted. Yeah. You muted yourself, right? My bad. I muted myself because the kid's in the background. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> oh, birthday. Take, birthday yeah. balloon. Oh yeah, you know, she was our it was her birthday on the 10th. Shout out to all the Scorpios. Um, so I got to ask this question, too, because I know we're running out on, on time going to that hour mark. But yeah. what role will black women play in the rest of the yes. series? And before you answer that, definitely can I figure out what the hell happened to Jonah's mama? Because I know she is savage. OK, I know she is savage. <laughs> I know you. it. Man. Shout out to shout out to what's the great grandpa name. Shout out to Swift Bear and the werewolf, the pack. All right. Shout out to oh, them. Wow. Yeah. Guys really... <laughs> We're really about that. Guys, we we everything, man. About you. <laughs> we, hey, hey, we got to be we got to make sure we know what we're talking about when we got guests up on the show. <laughs> Yeah, this is. I think this is one of the most thorough uh, interviews I've had. <laughs> Thank you, man. We do our best. We just want to show our love. Give you the flowers while you're here. Yeah. Um. So you you said you wanted to guess what happened to Jonas's mother? Is that what? Oh uh, no, I just really want to know what the what role black women will play uh, in the series. Mm -hmm. This is something that says I mentioned, and also just yes. because of Jonas's mom and, and some of the backdrops. If pe as people read, go to issue three or four, if yep. I'm not mistaken. That they get to see some of the conversations that Jonas's mother had mm -hmm. when uh, certain uh, certain deities or or, or um, gods, for lack of a better term, uh, were 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 around him. And I'll leave it at that. But like, what role are black women going to play in the series, uh, if any, more than what uh, 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 Kiki is going to play? Because Kiki is holding down Malcolm. Yep. So shout out to shout out to Kiki. <laughs> yeah, I like Kiki. Um, uh, she was named after that Drake song. Um, <laughs> I figured. I, I kind of figured that was the game. I was like, is that I thought so, but I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in a Kiki, I was like, I'm gonna not. You, love me. Was, you know, it's funny. It's one of those things I put in the script because I couldn't think of a better name, and I was like, yeah, whatever. But I ended up keeping it. <laughs> Do you love me? Okay, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's stay focused. Let's stay focused. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> But yeah, so um, yeah, I wanted to include uh, more black women because um, as I was writing the story, uh, my wife in particular was like 
pointed out to me. <laughs> yeah. I needed to to up my my mm -hmm. the, you know, the women in my story. Um so you know, of course you have Brittany who's Box's younger sister, right? Yep. And then right. you know, you have the introduction of Kiki. Um you had his mother in the first. I wish I had more time to do things with his mother because um she's really essential to how uh Jonas grew up and where he gets his powers and because it's her side of the family that that really has uh, that developed the the Creole magic it wasn't really from his uh father's side but oh, kinda um, get, I kind of got that kind of got that, yeah, from, that exactly. one, from that one clip and I mean one that one segment in the comic and shout out yeah. Charlotte all right shout out Charlotte yeah. trying to hold down Jonas yeah, Charlotte. <laughs> exactly she tried she was trying yeah so I, I really wanted to include more of his mother and I, I I may do a side story because um, nice. I want to show oh, what yeah. happened to his mother once Jonas is, um, dies, right? Because there's a big battle that happens after Jonas is, after Jonas gets killed. Like um, the order and Jonas's family basically goes to war. Man, and, full on, know, full on. Yeah, full, full on. Of course, Jonas's family. Um, you can tell they they lose the battle, um, but his mother. Um, alone is like is very powerful. Um, you got to show us that, man. You got to show us. Please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, honestly, that would be great. I, I think the biggest thing with, with women in general when it comes to comics, right, or just in general, any type of these type of media, a lot of times they'll be kind of like background characters or secondary characters where they get a hint at what their capabilities are mm -hmm. or just a little bit of their background, but it never plays out. I mean, a good example for me, which everybody knows the Marvel universe, you, think of, you look at Black Widow, look how long it took to even get the story of her. And then when you do get the story, you're just kind of like, that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, it's like, that's the type of thing that, especially when you think about black women, how black women are always portrayed in media as angry, aggressive, you know, they're one, you know, they're, they're this or they're that. And it never really shows that dynamic piece of them. And I think that with your story, you have so many different avenues that you could take it. And that's why part of me is just like, I would love to see more of them in it because of characters you have had, in there i think just have added so much more to the main male character so i'm i'm really excited to see where you go with it i think your creativity has no bounds so i'm really excited to see what you're going to do with that actually you know what i think this conversation has inspired me to actually uh, maybe i should just write the a little like mini series of like yes you should because <laughs> it, it would basically revolve around jordan's mother just like having all-out revenge on on the order and just like just <laughs> messing shit up. Won't be <laughs> the side of a person or entity that messes with a mama's baby. Yeah, Whoa, and, a woman scorn, as they always talk about. Hey, yeah, and, it's, and it's not like Jonas's family was rolling alone. He he has a he has a whole werewolf clan behind him too. And, Shout out to the pack, so. man. <laughs> Love That's the pack, cool. bro. I, love, I can't wait to see <laughs> like transformations of the pack because I was just like, I don't get it, and then I was like, I get it, I get it now. <laughs> The pack is fire. The pack is fire. Like hands down. I see why he said get the whole pack because I know what I know hey, what they bring him. Get everyone. Yeah, yeah. Get everyone. Yeah, he said, yeah, he said get everyone. So I, I definitely just again we passed the hour mark of course. So I don't want to take too much longer because I know this will get too crazy. We'll go a whole another hour talking about this. So I, I really do want to ask this question um, because it, we we running short on time. But what do you want the reader to feel when they uh, when they when they read your work of art, because I think this is something that a lot of people always like. When I finished it, this is what I thought. But what do you want the reader to take away? And I'll and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll leave it on you, and I'll let you go ahead and go and take it from here. Um, man, that's that's a tough question to answer because um, as 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 I started listening to the responses to the people who who read the story, everyone takes takes uh, so many different things from the, um, the story. I mean, everybody has their own interpretation of the characters, the reasons why they like a particular characters. Um, and people will pick up on one thing more than um, something else. Um, and it might weigh more heavily on them in terms of how, what they think about the story um, and have more impact. So it's hard to say, it, it's hard to say um, what I want them to feel from, I just, well, I want them to them to get from the story. I just want them to feel something. I want them, um, even if um, 
even if they miss all the social commentary <laughs> that I might put in there, um, I still want them to feel something, feel something human and something positive. Like, hey, you know, um, this this is the way, you know, things should work in the world. Um, and like, like, yeah, like I said, even if they miss the social commentary, I still want them to feel that that same goodness that you know that most people feel from like when you were reading comic books as a as a as a kid like wow you know the, the good guys always win um and you know the struggle's never over we must always conquer evil that, that yeah. that's basically it because it's it's hard to try to um all i try to do is just um put myself out there and um the the way i see the world in into my comics and that's that's the best I could do. And then it's up to the reader just to kind of pick up on whatever they want to pick up and then um, how they feel from that. But I, I just even though my, my comics are really gritty, <laughs> I love writing gritty st stories. I still want them to have a feeling like there's there's always hope and there's always this this um, this need to always push forward and improve things. And with that, we, I mean, we just we gonna just leave it at that. I mean, that was a wonderful way to end it. It's it, it's Crescent City Monsters. You, if you if if you are a fan and a part of the community of, of Black Nerd Friday, we have we have brought to you um, and we continue to bring to you more wonderful creators like Mr. Newton from uh, Dream Fury Comics, and, and just also just the stories. Like, really, it is a extension of at least what I'm learning is that most of this. These, uh, these creations of art are literally like bits and pieces of the creator put into either a paper form or a digital form for you to experience and really is just read it, read it and, and you will enjoy it. it. It goes by fast because you get immersed into the world. And uh, I just want to let you know uh, again, Newton, man, I appreciate you and the rest of the team at, 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 at Dream Fury. So shout out to, and give everybody's name too, because I want to say Glenn, but I know that's not the right name. Who's who's all the other people on the team? <laughs> oh yeah, so we have the artist, the amazing Giancarlo Bernal, who's shout held, out held from the Philippines. That's my boy right there. Um, we've been doing this together for like four years now, hmm. and you know I've I've been really blessed to. I, I really think. Um, a higher being put us together, no doubt for sure. Um, the, the way I look at it, um, because you know, I, I really lucked out with an artist like Gene, and we've got that partnership that you know, it's been like around for at least four years now. And I, you know, I don't, I don't see it that stopping anytime soon. Um, that's my boy right there. So, um, yeah, shout out to Gene, and then, um, another shout out to um, Shawanda Marie, she's the uh consultant that I use, cultural consultant that I use. Um, she's from, yes. she was uh, raised in New Orleans. She's a very strong advocate of um, keeping that Creole culture in New Orleans. Um, so she she helps me make sure that I don't mix my, um, my Creole culture and my um, Cajun culture. <laughs> <laughs> don't know, do that <laughs> yeah so and you know she she gives me advice in terms of things that um uh i that make sure that i re represent new orleans um respectfully so big shout out to shawanda appreciate that again black nerd fridays go get crescent city monsters as mr newton his sons is your host d neil shout out to Mr. Refine, who had to go. And we Good will catch you on the next episode of Black Nerd Fridays. Cheers. And I'm about to end this. So it's going to keep going. Again, on the